Welcome back, Escalia family. My name is Dr. Herrera. I am the founder of Escalia Health, an elite level functional nutrition and coaching service, as well as the creator of the Metabolic Mastery Project. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about how NAFLD, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is actually diagnosed. And in particular, we're going to be discussing in particular how NAFLD is diagnosed, the specific criteria, what doctors you should be seeing that specialize and they can actually have the necessary training in order to deal with this condition, what your blood test results actually mean and how to understand them a little better, what imaging equipment is used and what are the differences between an ultrasound, fiber scan, etc. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about how to calculate your FIB4 score so you can identify what level of fibrosis you are potentially at. So let's get started. Now, before we begin, I do wanna make it very clear that this information is intended just for educational purposes only. It is not meant to diagnose anything. It is not meant to train you to diagnose yourself. That should be done under the care of a properly licensed medical professional, such as an MD or DO, etc. That being said, let's start with what kind of doctor you should be consulting with when trying to determine whether or not you have NAFLD. Now, typically, most people are originally diagnosed or evaluated by a general practitioner medical doctor, and that's fine. However, a general practitioner medical doctor may not have the specialized training necessary or the knowledge necessary in order to accurately diagnose or even deal with someone who has NAFLD. That being said, what I would recommend is for you, if you're suspected or, or if you think that you have NAFLD or you have a diagnosis, to go actually visit and talk to a gastroenterologist or a hepatologist. These two type of doctors are specialists that can specifically handle anything that has to do with liver dysfunction, NAFLD, and any stage or range of this disease. Now, one thing that you need to understand when it comes to the diagnosis of NAFLD is that it can actually be pretty tricky to do so. And that's because non-alcoholic fatty liver disease doesn't have a specific set of symptoms or biomarkers or lab test results that are indicative and that point to a specific diagnosis of this disease. And so a lot of times it can go under the radar. This is why many of you probably did not know that you had an FLD until you went for a routine checkup where they just happened to do an ultrasound or some kind of blood test that showed that you had some kind of liver dysfunction. Now, when it comes to the actual evaluation process, your doctor should take into account several different factors when trying to diagnose NAFLD. The first thing that's often done is a series of blood tests, right? Specifically the CMP or the CBC. CMP stands for Comprehensive Metabolic Panel, and then CBC is the Complete Blood Count panel. These two blood tests in particular can actually show you a lot of information to give an insight as to what your liver function is like. The next thing that your doctor will do, or at least should do in order to rule out NAFLD is to actually schedule some kind of imaging done, right? Things like ultrasounds or fibro scans, for example. And these imaging techniques will actually allow your doctor to actually physically see and observe the status of your liver. Other things that your doctor should also be evaluating is, of course, the, the typical physical exam where he actually physically assesses you. Also, any medications, he should review any medications that you're under, because there are a lot of medications that could potentially trigger or cause the development of NAFLD. And then finally, your doctor should actually evaluate any comorbidities. And that's a fancy term, basically saying any other diseases or illnesses that you are experiencing that could contribute to the development of NAFLD or worsen it. Things like obesity, type two diabetes, metabolic syndrome, hypothyroidism, colon cancer, cardiovascular disease, these are all typical comorbidities that, that are often found with people that have NAFLD or developing NAFLD. So now let's talk about your blood test results and what some of those values mean. Now, typically you will, your doctor will order either a CMP or a CBC or usually a combination of both of those. Now, these values are often found in the CMP panel. So if you have a copy of your blood test results, you can actually follow along as I kind of break this down for you. And what I did here is actually pull out some of the more common lab test results that are typically found in someone who has NAFLD. Of course, there are a lot more lab values that we can evaluate, but these are kind of the common ones that, that always pop up. The first one is AST, right? This is something that most people are familiar with or have seen in their lab test results. You typically see an elevation of what's called AST levels. Now, AST is an enzyme. That's all that that is. And it's an enzyme that is found in your liver, in your kidneys, in your muscles, and also your heart tissue, right? Typically, when we see an elevation of AST, 
it can potentially point to a dysfunction in your liver. However, in and of itself, it's not accurate enough to assess because AST is also found in your kidneys and your muscles and your heart. And oftentimes when you get a heart attack, for example, your AST levels will also elevate. So in and of itself, it's not specific enough to diagnose or to uh, point out liver disease such as NAFLD, but it is a part of the puzzle. Now the next one is ALT, which is another common one. ALT, when it's elevated, indicates that the enzyme, because ALT is also an enzyme, is, uh, is secreting from your liver because ALT, as the enzyme, is exclusively found in your liver. So it's a little more specific. And these enzymes are supposed to be found just in within the cells themselves, right? So if we see them in the bloodstream, which is how they're measured, right? These are blood tests. That means that they're leaking out of the liver cells and pouring out into the bloodstream, which points to some kind of dysfunction or damage because they're not supposed to be in the bloodstream. They're supposed to be in the cells. So something's going on there. ALT is a little more specific when it comes to the, to the diagnosis and evaluation of NAFLD because it is primarily found in the liver. Now the next enzyme is ALP. ALP is pretty interesting because it's an enzyme that's found within the bile system of your liver, specifically in what's called the canoniculi. Now the canoniculi is a fancy word that describes sort of the, the highways and the tunnels and the roads that are found within your liver that bile gets moved through and transports through and travels through, right? ALP is an enzyme that is found within those tunnels within your liver. So again, if you get elevated amounts of ALP in your bloodstream, that means that they're leaking out from that tunnel system, which points to some kind of damage that's occurring there. The next one is GGT. Again, another common one. It's an enzyme, right? Like many of these are. And it's an enzyme that's specifically found within the bile ducts of the liver. So very similar to ALP, they're supposed to only be found in those areas. If they're found in the bloodstream, right? If they're being secreted into the bloodstream, that means there's some kind of leakage going on, which points to, again, some kind of damage or dysfunction. Think of your car leaking oil, right? The oil is not supposed to be all over the floor underneath your car, right? It's supposed to be found within the car itself, the engine itself. Very similar situation here. The next one is bilirubin. Bilirubin is an interesting one because bilirubin is a waste product, right? It's called a metabolite and it's secreted when red blood cells start to degrade and start to break down because normally red blood cells have a certain lifespan. Eventually they'll break down, which is completely normal and they'll get replaced. Now, as a result of that breakdown, bilirubin gets released. What you need to understand about bilirubin is that your liver is responsible for getting rid of all that excess waste through your bile, which then gets secreted into your gallbladder, which then gets secreted into your small intestine and eventually your large intestine, and then you excrete it through your feces, right? So that's what's supposed to happen. When you get elevated amounts of bilirubin in your bloodstream, that means that your liver isn't getting rid of it for some reason. And it usually indicates some kind of dysfunction in that bile system. Again, it's related to GGT and ALP in that if you get an elevated amount of it, that means there's something wrong in that system, usually some kind of damage, which is another indicator of uh, liver disease of some kind. The next one is albumin. Albumin is a protein that is produced exclusively by the liver. Your liver makes albumin proteins, right? It's really important. So when you see a reduction or low levels of albumin, that means that there's something going on with your liver. It's not producing enough, usually because there's some kind of damage or dysfunction going on there. Again, another indicator of liver disease. Another thing you need to understand about albumin is that when it's floating around in your blood in adequate amounts, it has the ability to actually pull water right, and fluid from the spaces in between your muscles and your organs and your tissues and into the bloodstream so that it can be excreted out through your kidneys or processed in some other way. However, if you have low amounts of albumin, which is very common with people with, with liver disease, especially cirrhosis, then your ability to pull fluid from those spaces is reduced. And this is where you can start to develop things like ascites, right? That, that build up a fluid around your organs and your usually your abdomen. And that's because you don't have enough albumin in your blood to pull that fluid out from those spaces and in through your, in through your bloodstream. And then last but certainly not least, we have the INR and prothrombin levels, which are usually elevated. These are clotting factors, right? These are factors that allow your body to clot. And they're usually elevated in the presence of some kind of liver disease, especially NAFLD. 
and are used in conjunction with everything else in order to determine whether or not there's something going on with your liver. Which brings me to another point. When it comes to diagnosis, you don't just take one factor or one lab result or one thing and then say, oh, you have liver dysfunction. No, you have to take into account the entire picture, right? Because a lot of these enzyme levels and a lot of these proteins can actually indicate other dysfunctions as well in your body. They're not just limited to your liver disease or liver health. So it's important that you understand that this will also be taken into account along with your the imaging results, your physical exam, your health history, your comorbidities. It's just a piece of the puzzle. But it's a piece of the puzzle that's important, especially for you to understand when you're reading your lab results. So now let's talk about imaging, right? What kind of imaging techniques are often used in order to diagnose or evaluate NAFLD. The first one, and by far the most common one, and is typically what everyone goes through first, is the abdominal ultrasound, right? Or just the ultrasound. This is by far the most common starting place when it comes to diagnosing. Now, what I want you to understand about the ultrasound machine, and this is based on the studies and the science, is that the ultrasound is only sensitive enough to pick up a fatty liver if there's at least 20% fat in that liver or more. If there's less than 20% fat in the liver, then it's probably not gonna be sensitive to pick it up. That's really important to understand because if you did get positively identified with a fatty liver, chances are you're actually about 20%, which is pretty advanced. Right when you get 20, 30% infiltration, you're approaching stages like NASH where you start to get a lot of inflammation. The other thing you need to understand about the ultrasound is that it is not sensitive enough and it cannot measure the inflammation or the level of fibrosis in the liver. It's not meant to do that, it is not sensitive, and it's not capable of detecting those two things. Which then brings us to the second most common type of imaging that is often used, and that is the fibro scan, right? Or the elastography, right? As it is sometimes called. Now the fibro scan is a specific form of ultrasound, right? It's a specific type of ultrasound that measures the amount of stiffness in the liver, right? And based on the amount of stiffness, Right? And there's a whole equation to kind of calculate what that means. The doctor, your doctor, can actually determine the level of fibrosis that is currently present in that liver. Now, the fibro scan is typically really good at identifying advanced fibrosis, like F3, F4, right? Advanced fibrosis. It is less sensitive or is kind of okay at detecting mild fibrosis, right? So think F1 or F2. So there are certain limitations with the fibro scan, but it's still better to identify fibrosis uh, than the ultrasound. But the other thing you have to understand too is that if you do get a positive result in your fibro scan, what should happen, it doesn't always happen, but what should happen is that your doctor should then order uh, what's called a liver biopsy in order to confirm or deny the presence of fibrosis. Which then again, so now that we're talking about liver biopsy, the liver biopsy is kind of the gold standard, right? It's the next one here. It is by far the most accurate form of diagnosing and uh, of a diagnostic technique in order to identify not just NAFLD, but what stage you're at. And what basically happens with the liver biopsy is that they uh, inject a, ne a needle, a really long needle, into your side, or this side rather, and they actually extract a piece of your liver, right? And then they take it out and they put it under a microscope and then they evaluate it. And that will tell them what stage of your liver disease that you're at and is by far the most accurate. However, it's not typically used or ordered unless your doctor has reason to believe that you have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. Then for sure, you're probably gonna get a liver biopsy in order to confirm. The other thing you need to understand too that it's often a little painful because they are kind of poking you in the side a little bit. Um, it's also a bit invasive and also it's expensive. So a lot of times it's not ordered if your doctor doesn't suspect that you have some kind of advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. And then lastly, we have the MRI and the CT scan. These two are not typically utilized because they're not very effective for NAFLD in particular. For example, they can't detect inflammation and they're also really expensive and, and time consuming to do. Uh, so oftentimes doctors don't actually utilize the MRI or CT scan. However, sometimes they do and that's why I added it to the list. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is the use of calculators, right? Different calculating tools in order to determine, for example, what level of fibrosis that you might be at, right? The first one, the most common one, is the FIB4 score. Now, the FIB4 score is a fairly complex mathematical formula that you can utilize by taking some of your lab values, like your AST and your ALT, for example, and you plug it into this equation, and then it'll spit out a specific score that will determine 
what level of fibrosis you're at. Now, in order to save you the trouble of actually doing the calculation yourself, which can be fairly complex, I'm going to include a free tool that you can utilize in this module where you can just plug in the different uh, bits of information, press enter, and then it'll spit out your score super easily. Now, for those of you that are in the sort of advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis stage, you might come across into what's called a MELD score, right? That's M-E-L-D score. Now, the MELD score is typically utilized by your doctor to determine your need for a liver transplant. That's what basically the MELD score is for. And again, that calculation is usually done by your doctor in order to assess and evaluate that for you. Now, the MELT score uh, ranges from 6 to 40, right? And basically, just to kind of give you a rough idea, if you hit a score of 20, a MELT score of 20 or above, then chances are you're probably going to need some uh, liver transplant, right? If you're below that, there's a less chance, but there is some research and studies that show that even a score of 15 will actually warrant a referral to, to actually get a liver transplant. So that is it for today's video. Let me know what you thought about in the comment section about the content. Did it help you? Did it not help you? Is there something more that you wish that I covered? Let me know. I love the feedback. It helps me improve these videos. Thank you again for participating in the Metabolic Mastery Project.